Alright, well good morning. Good morning. Y'all can do better than that. Good morning. Good morning. It's the day the Lord has made. Let us be rejoicing and be glad in it. And uh, you know, I'm, I'm blessed to be here this morning. I've, I've preached once, once here before, about a little over a year ago. And since that time, I've made a lot of friends. And uh, you know, we uh, are brothers and sisters in Christ. And we have a family in this church family, do we not? Yes, As brothers and sisters. And you know... Jesus loves us. He's a friend closer than a brother. And it's my privilege and honor to open God's Word from 1 Samuel chapter 16. 1 Samuel chapter 16. We're going to be studying uh, verses 1 through 13. Verses 1 through 4, uh, 13. But before we get started, I just want to say, uh, you know, uh, I just want to let you all know how much I love you guys. And you all have adopted my family. Many of you all are, you know, just uh, on my prayers every day. And, uh, you know, we uh, are certainly blessed to have Pastor Lawson here leading us, showing us and preaching the Word of God and training these other men to go out into the churches and missionary fields throughout the world to preach the Word of God to people that live in darkness. And we need to pray for him as he's teaching another congregation there at FBC, Icard or Ickard or however I'm from Tennessee, so y'all look over me there. So, uh, so anyway, I call it Ickard, y'all can call it Icard, however. It sounds better to you. But uh, my sermon title, since I am from Tennessee, my sermon title is Image Ain't Everything. Image Ain't Everything. Now you know my background is in advertising. And uh, it's how I provide for my family. God allowed me to get a a bachelor's degree from Carson Newman College, which again, East Tennessee. And uh, and so I, I design graphic designs and websites and all that, and that's how I provide for my family. Uh, but you know, Canon, uh, you know the camera company, Canon, they make copiers and stuff. They had an ad campaign, a real famous one back in the 1980s and early 1990s. And, and y'all remember Andre Agassi, you know, the famous tennis player? And what I remember about him is he had this rocking mullet. I mean, he had a beautiful set of hair, right? Now, I had some slides, but we had a technical problem, so they didn't come out. But he had a rocking hairdo, man. I mean, it was great. And they were always showing on the cover of those magazines with just the right pose and that flowing hair, kind of like Fabio for you ladies that remember Fabio from the... Yeah, I probably shouldn't mention that. Y'all might get in trouble. But you know Fabio. But he had this rocking hairdo. And, but the funny thing, you know what the funny thing is? You know, we got to have truth in advertising, shouldn't we? And that's one thing I stand by. It's truth in advertising. But you know what Ken pulled on us? Did you know that Andre actually is bald? Did you know that? He's a red on those commercials. And man, I felt cheated. And I, I was reading a little thing about him on the internet as I prepared my message for this week. And he was saying how nervous and paranoid he'd get at the French Open because they had a lot of wind that blew through there and he's afraid that wind could blow off. And then it'd be up, the gig would be up, right? He wouldn't, he, he wouldn't have that, that image, right? And, uh, you know, my, my brother-in-law, he's a, uh, an insurance claims adjuster. He has to go to court a lot of times uh, to go on behalf of the insurance company. And he goes and he's like a, a secret agent, like a detective. He'll, he'll go and these guys, you know, they'll come in and like, like get a lawyer that's chasing the ambulance and they'll come in with a neck brace and then in, uh, you know, the wheelchairs and, 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 and they'll be wheeled into that courtroom because the insurance company wouldn't pay, you know, for all their medical bills and all this, what they're wanting. And, and he'll go out and spy on them. And he'll go, and he'll go at the soccer fields and take his camera and take pictures and, and all this stuff, you know. But, you know, it's amazing because he was telling me a story. This man, he came in, and he was all busted up. I mean, he had, you know, his uh, cast. He looked like a mummy. He had so many bandages on him, neck brace. And he went out there and took pictures. And the man, it's like Benny Hinn laid hands on this man at a revival. And he was up dancing around at a party on, on that Saturday night, and he took pictures of him. And it was amazing how he turned from cripple to Superman the next day. <laughs> But you know, in our culture, image is a big part, isn't it? You know, they say image is everything. Image is this, image is that. And you know, uh, it, it's not cool. You look, you don't see too many fat models, do you, on, on the magazines? You know, our little girls, you know, and, you know they, they, they get on, what, bulimia, they get bullied at school because they don't want to look a certain way, right? And you think about it, even our culture makes our, skin, our Christmas trees go skinny now, don't they? How many of y'all, be honest, how many of y'all got a skinny Christmas tree this year? Man, I see. There's some of y'all honest enough to admit it. But you know, I think about that skinny Christmas tree. You know what it reminds me of? It reminds me of that Charlie Brown. You remember that little, that little dainty Christmas tree? You couldn't even put a bulb on it. And you know, you kids, you can't put the presents under them little skinny Christmas trees. They're too little. Can't put nothing under them. 
Here's the thing. Image ain't everything. Now some of y'all judged me as soon as I said that, didn't you? Who in the world what kind of redneck come up here and say the title of his sermon is Image ain't everything? Don't he know nothing? But the point is, we make instantaneous judgments on the things we look at and the people we see. Now some of y'all made instantaneous judgments when I walked up here. And you said, man, that man is handsome. I'm telling you what. <laughs> <laughs> but those are the ones wearing those tough on the glasses and legally blind, okay? I'll be honest. But look around. Turn around and look at it. how good looking y'all are. Turn around and look at all nice in your suits and all dressed up and fancy. Except for a couple of you scraggly ones sitting out there in the back. But, but, but here's the thing. When we greet, let's not get serious now, when we greet a homeless person, who maybe smells bad and hadn't had a bath in two or three weeks, whose clothes are nasty and torn. And what if they walk here? Will we greet those people the same way that we would greet Pastor Lawson or Brother Dickey or any of you others? Would we? Guys, that's a shallow way to look at things. You know, any, any reputable bookseller will tell you that the top selling books will always have, what, a pretty cover. A pretty cover. That's how I do business, right? They hire me to make those pretty covers, right? That's my business. But we should not have the same outlook towards people that the world has. We should see people through the eyes of Jesus Christ because every single human being, whether they're rich or whether they're poor, whether they're black or whether they're white, whether they speak English or whether they speak another language, they're made in God's image. Did you know that? And Genesis 1, 26 and 7 says, Let us, in plural, make man in our image. The first reference, I believe, to the Trinity. You see, every human being on planet earth is worthy of our respect. It's worthy of dignity. It's worthy of God's love. And it's worthy of the Gospel. And we must be loving people the way God loves people who are made in His image. You think about this. Jesus tells us, He says, by this, people will know that you're Christian. By the fact you drive a Lexus. <laughs> by the fact you drive a Mercedes. <laughs> by the fact you live in a country club or a $500,000 home. No. He says, by this, people will know that you're believers, that you have what? Love for one another. No matter how they look or what they can bring to the table. You know, first impressions, that's what we have to talk about, our first impressions. You know, our first impressions can be wrong a lot of times. As we're going to look at the text today and see. If you're able-bodied, would you stand with me as I read our key verse this morning from 1 Samuel 16, 7? 1 Samuel 16, 7. And the reason I ask you to stand is Ezra opened the book of the law in Nehemiah chapter 8, verse 5. Uh, as Ezra opened the book of the law, the people stood up to show honor and reverence at the reading of God's Word. And verse 7 says, But the Lord said to Samuel, Do not look at his appearance or at the height of his stature, because I have rejected him. For God sees, not as man sees, for man looks at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. Let us pray. Dear Lord Father, I just thank You, Lord, for the people here. I thank You most of all for Your Son, Jesus, who died on the cross for my sins and the sins of every one of us here today. I pray that they would not hear a word from Greg, but they would hear a word from the living God. I pray that I would decrease, that you might increase, Lord. I pray that today might be the day of salvation for someone here that has never put their faith and trust in you. And I ask this in the name above every name, the name at which every knee will bow and every tongue will confess, the name of Jesus. I ask this in your name. Amen. Y'all can be seated. Thank you. So there are five scenes in our text today. Five scenes. Read with me in chapter 16, verses 1 through 3. The first scene. As we see that we ought to listen to God's instruction. 16, 1 through 3. We should listen to God's instruction. Now the Lord said to Samuel, How long, Samuel, will you grieve over Saul, since I have rejected him from being king over Israel? Fill your horn with oil and go. I will send you to Jesse and the Bethlehemite. For I have selected a king for myself among his sons. But Samuel said, How can I go when Saul hears of it? He will kill me. And the Lord said, Take a heifer with you and say, I have come to sacrifice to the Lord. 
You shall invite Jesse to the sacrifice, and I will show you what you shall do, and you shall anoint for me the one whom I designate to you. So a little bit of background to this story. We see a man named Samuel, a prophet. Now Samuel's very name means God has heard. And you see in the opening chapters of Samuel, you see his mother, Hananiah, and his dad, Elkanah. They could not have Hannah and Elkanah. They could not have children. And so Hannah goes before the Lord because in that culture and time, it would have been looked at as she was cursed by God because she could not have children. And when she petitioned to the Lord, God heard her prayer and she had a baby named Samuel. And Samuel was dedicated to the Lord and even sat under a man named Eli who was a wicked, fat old priest and his sons, Hophnus and Phinehas, they desecrated the Lord in his, in his work. But we see also in chapter 8, we see that the Israel demands a king after they've been tormented in chapters 4-7 through seven with the Philistines. The Philistines have stolen the Ark of the Covenant, but they later returned it because of God's wrath. And in chapter 8, Israel demands a king like the pagan nations. But here's the thing. God wanted to be their king. God wanted to be their king. God wants to be ruler of your life right now. Did you know that? The problem is, we want to be God. The problem is we will not let go and let God take the reins of our life because sometimes God leads us in hard places. Sometimes God takes us in directions that we do not want to go. I'll give you an example from my own life. Here I am, 25 years old, 26 years old. Got a successful position in Lockheed Martin. Got a four bedroom, three bath house, making good money for someone my age. Living, quote unquote, the American dream, but you know what that American dream was a nightmare. It was a nightmare because I was not doing the work of God. God called me to preach a 17 year old, and I spent nine years, ten years of my life running from God. It's like Jonah got on a ship to Tarshish and ran from God. And I'm telling you, you put a storm in my life to put me to my knees. Y'all been there? Y'all having hard stories in here? I bet if you're honest, you probably do. Here's the thing, God got a hold of me and put me in a place where He could use me and told me to get my house in order. So here I went from making a six-figure salary and all this to go and enroll at Southeastern Seminary to fulfill the calling that God put on my life to be a preacher and teacher of His Word. And even my own mother and father-in-law, I'm just being real with y'all this morning because that's the way to be, amen. It ain't, this ain't no sugar-coated stuff. I get persecution even from my own family members who look at me and think I'm a fool for giving up my business. I think I'm a fool for doing the work that I'm doing because why would you, Greg, they would say, why would you give up your business? Why would you do what you're doing to go to a place where you ain't going to get paid nothing? Why would you do that? And I tell them because one called me who's greater than me. One called me who who sees where my treasure is, and it better be on eternal things, not on Lexuses and gated communities. If you got a Lexus, I, I'm not preaching. The thing, the thing is, you might, have, you might have had a Lamborghini if you didn't buy a Lexus, amen, right? But here's, here's the thing. Sometimes God calls us to do hard things, and it costs us. Are we willing to pay the price to follow God? <coughs> You see, because it cost God everything to send His Son. God gave His best for us. You ever think about that? How much it cost God for us to be with Him? You ever think about that? You know, we think about God's grace and sometimes that grace, it becomes a meaningless word because we say it so much, it doesn't really mean anything anymore. We wear a cross like a piece of jewelry around our neck. But do we know what it cost our Savior to go to that cross? Can you comprehend the pain and the suffering it cost our Lord as He took those slaps on His back with the cat and nine tails embedded with pieces of bone and steel shards? You ever thought about that? You ever thought about how much love it took for Him even when He said, My Father, please, if it would be Your will, let this cup pass from Me. But not My will, but Your will be done. Let me ask you this. When's the last time you guys have ever done anything great for the Lord Jesus Christ? When have you ever sacrificed something, not just financially, when have you sacrificed and done something hard for the Lord? I'll just leave that with you. Look here at what it says. Samuel was, his family dedicated him to the Lord to do the Lord's work. They might have wanted him to be a great farmer, a great leader, but they gave him to the Lord, God. Could we do that with our kids? 
If we dedicate our children to go and be a missionary in a hard place, maybe Iraq where they might be killed. I had a friend at the seminary who lost her life because of the faith she professed and was a martyr for her faith. And we let our children do that. We see in chapter 14, Jonathan saw son, his brave victory over the Philistines and saw stupid order, which even was going to take the life of his own son. In chapter 15, we see God regretted that Saul was king. Samuel rebuked Saul. And we also see an inclusio in verse 1. And what an inclusio is is a repeated phrase that kind of bookends or brackets our text and makes it look it's like, like putting a highlighter over the Scripture saying this is very important, this passage. But I want you to notice here there are seven orders that God gives to Samuel here in our text this morning. And five of these orders come in verses 1 through 3. First of all, we see that God tells Samuel to fill your horn with oil. Then He tells him to go. And for you seminary students, that's a popular word around our campus, isn't it? Go. So fill your horn with oil. Go. And then, and that's in verse 1. And then the third one is take a heifer with you and tell them you're sacrificing to Yahweh. And that's in verse 2. The fourth one is invite Jesse to the sacrifice. So there's going to be others invited. And number five, to anoint my chosen king. In verse 3. Now, <clears throat> it's, it's interesting when we, when we look at this, you know, the, the names are, are, very, are very important. You know, the name of Saul, it means one who's asked of Yahweh or, or to borrow or ask or inquire. And so the people ask God, send us a king. And God says, hey man, I've been your king the whole time. Why do you want somebody else? Are you saying somebody's better than me? Is somebody better than God? But they didn't want God to be their king. So let's look at scene 2 in verses 4 through 5. The Bible says, So Samuel did what the Lord said. <laughs> he was obedient. He, he did what the Lord said and came to Bethlehem. Now in the, the original language, Bethlehem means the house of bread, the house of food, Bethlehem, the house of bread. And isn't it a wonderful gospel truth that the bread of life, the Lord Jesus Christ, comes from the house of bread? Amen? It's a wonderful promise from Scripture. It says, And the elders of the city came trembling, scared to death, to meet Him and said, Do you come in peace? Why do you think they would be scared like that of Samuel? Right? Y'all know David Banner, right? From the the comic books. He, He turned into what? He turned into the Hulk, right? He got mad. He turned into the Hulk. You know, Jesus took that cat and I tells went over turned the money changers tables, didn't he? But here's the thing, what was the command that, that God had given to Saul as, as the king that the people wanted? He said, when you go into the Malachites, you destroy them. You wipe them out. Like we talked about in Sunday school, destroy them. Well, what did they do? He brought his buddy. Here's, here's the king, right? Brought him in there, old King Agath. Brought him right there by his side. And brought some of the richest spoils with him. And he disobeyed God. He lied about it in chapter 15. But what did Samuel do? Was he cool with it? Was he, was he happy with it? It says he cut him into pieces. He went into Hulk mode, guys. He went into Hulk mode. Now, now, if you heard this story, how a man took a machete or an axe, or, well, I don't know what kind of tool they'd have in those days, but if, if you heard a story that here's this man of God, this prophet, who just hacked this man into 20 pieces, wouldn't you be a little bit scared too if you had unrepentant sin in your life? I believe I would be. <laughs> But the thing is, he was not afraid to do God's work. He was willing to do whatever God asked of him. He did not turn from the right. He did not turn from the left. But he did just as the Lord had asked of him. Now we see here in verse 5, he said, In peace, I come in peace, I have come to sacrifice to the Lord. Consecrate yourselves and come with me to sacrifice. And what that means is, it means to set apart. It's the word kadosh, which means to make holy, to make separate, to, to sanctify yourself. In other words, it would involve a ritual or a ceremonial cleansing. A lot of times it would often require them to change and put on new clothes. It's like we put on our Sunday best, right? And look what else what he says. He said he also consecrated Jesse and his sons, kind of as an aside. And that's an important point, and we'll come back to that a little bit later. Because one of the sons is not there, you see. And invited them to the sacrifice also. Now look at verse uh, verses 6 through 7. We see the third scene. Don't judge a book by its cover. Don't judge a book by its cover in verse 6 and 7. And it says, When they entered, he looked at Eliab. And Eliab's name means God is my father. 
and thought, surely the Lord's anointed. This is the same word that we have for Messiah. The same word in Messiah. When the Bible speaks of Jesus as the Messiah, it's saying Jesus is God's anointed, His Holy One who is set apart and promised all the way back from Genesis 3.15. The first reference to the coming Redeemer who would save the people from their sin. The Bible says that the Satan would bruise his heel, but the Satan would crush his head. Now, if I were standing before you with an aluminum baseball bat, and I said, Alan, where would you rather me hit you with this baseball bat? On your head or on your foot? Which one would you rather me hit you on, right? The foot. I hope you'd say that. Because the thing is, I used to be an all-star baseball player. We could do some damage with that bat. But the point is, Jesus got the victory. He has the victory. Do you know you could summarize the entire book of Revelation with two words? Did you know that? Did you know that? Jesus wins. He wins. And we got the victory. But too many times we live what is defeated people. We don't do much for God. Why? Because we're scared or we, we, we're afraid of what people think. We're afraid of the image, right, that we might portray. We'd be looked at as, you know, these, these Bible thumping fundamentalist Christians. Well, I tell you what, if you ain't standing for someone, and I say to the Lord Jesus Christ, you'll fall for anything. We better be standing on the truth of God and His Word. The Bible says. <clears throat> The Bible says here in, in verse uh, 7, it says, The Lord said to Samuel, Do not look at Eliab's appearance or at the height because of his stature, because I have rejected him. Now this word rejected, it literally means I have cast him away. He is worthless to me. It's like, it's like you get food that's spoiled. Okay, like they give you, uh, maybe you go to the grocery store and you get a gallon of milk and you sniff it and it's, it's, even though the date is right, it smells bad and what you, you reject it, you throw it out. It's worthless. Now I want you to imagine this. Eliab is David's oldest brother. And imagine he is, the Bible, from what we can understand in verse 7 to 8, we know that he's tall. And, and he's probably muscular. He probably looks the part. I can imagine y'all ever watch those uh, bodybuilding. I, I, when I was a young boy, I used to aspire to be like you know, Joe Atlas and Arnold Schwarzenegger. And I'd read those magazines. And those men, they come up here and do the, you know, the double biceps and do all these poses you know, and all this. I can imagine old Eli strutting across the stage showing off his muscles and all this. And you know, old, old Samuel, he got caught up in that image as everything bit, didn't he? He said, surely this is the one. Surely this has got to be the man. But what did God say? Did He look at that guy just like Samuel? No. He said, I've rejected him. Rejected him. Because God doesn't see people the way we do. You see, some people look at each other and make judgments on the way they look, the car they drive, Things they say, maybe. But you know where God looks? <laughs> right here. Right here. Turn your Bible to, uh, to Matthew. Matthew's Gospel, chapter 23. For time's sake, I'm going to go ahead and read Matthew chapter 23, verse 25 through 27. <clears throat> the Bible says, and this is Jesus talking, uh, putting the Pharisees in their place. <laughs> He says, Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, you hypocrites! For you clean the outside of your cup and of the dish, but inside you're full of robbery and self-indulgence. Hmm. Self-indulgence. Wow. You blind Pharisee, first clean the inside of your cup and of the dish so that the outside of it may become clean also. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites! For you are like whitewashed tombs, which on the outside, get this, appear beautiful, but on the inside, they're full of dead men's bones and uncleanness. They're worthless. You see, guys, it's not our appearance here that matters. It's what matters here to God. Here. Look, at, look ahead a little bit in 1 Samuel 17 and we're going to see the true heart of his brother Eliab. Starting at verse 24, the Bible says, when all the men of Israel, 1 Samuel 17, 24, when all the men of Israel saw the man, this is, this is uh, talking about Goliath, right? They fled from him and were greatly afraid. Now verse 28 says, now Eliab, David's oldest brother, heard when David spoke to the men and, and Eliab's anger burned against David. It says, why have you come down here? 
And with whom have you left those few sheep? In other words, all David was good for to his big brother was to watch those stinking little sheep. And he says, I know your insolence, David. Your witness of your heart. You have come down in order just to see the battle, see people get killed. And David, like any little brother, this, this, this makes me laugh when I read it, is I just imagine my little boy's doing this. What have I done now? <laughs> what have I done now? Was it not just a question? You see, God knew Eliab, and He knew that he wasn't a man of courage. He knew he was a coward, just like Saul. Now let's look at the next scene in scene 4. God's ways are infinitely higher and better than man's ways. Look at 8 through 10 of 16. Then Jesse called Abinadab, which means my father has volunteered me for war. (laughs) Which is interesting because what did they do? They all fled and ran and hid like in caves when Goliath came. And he made him pass before Samuel. And Samuel said, The Lord's not chosen this one either. Next, Jesse made Shema pass by. So three of them. The top three. The ones that they thought would have been the men. And he said, The Lord hasn't chosen this one either. Thus Jesse made all seven of his sons, the number of completion, pass before Samuel. But Samuel said to Jesse, The Lord has not chosen these. He has not chosen them. In other words, by showing this a number of completion, God is telling us from His Word that man's ways are infinitely lower than God's ways. And even though man might have thought, this is the one, this is the one, this is the one, God said, I've rejected them. I've rejected them. So here's, here's where we can glean from this, guys. There might be some people that come in through this ministry here and maybe they don't look the part. Maybe they don't look quite right. Maybe they don't say the things that you would expect them to say and you discount them when they never have an opportunity that maybe some of the other ones that look the part might have. But did you know that God might have chosen them to do a great work? And did you know that we can get in the way sometimes of God's work when we're too ignorant to see things the way God does? Did you know that? Don't ever discount someone made in God's image. Don't ever think that God can't use... Uh, uh, an alcoholic, a former drug addict. Don't ever think that God can't use a former prostitute. Someone that had an abortion. Someone who ain't got nothing but the clothes on their back to do His work. Because when you make judgments like that, you're no better than the Pharisee that stands in Luke 18 over the the tax collector and says, Thank you, Jesus, that I'm not like this nasty scumbag sinner down here. God reached way down from me. And I'm going to lift His name up forever as a result. We ain't good, guys. I tell you right now, we ain't good. If Jesus Christ Himself, the rich young ruler, comes to Him and says, Good teacher! And He said, Why are you calling me good? There's none good but God, the Father. And I tell you right now this morning, if you think you're good and the Lord Jesus Christ said He ain't good, you won't sit on thin ice. Because God says, There's only one good, Him. So let's look at our last scene in verse 11 through 13. The Bible says, And Samuel said to Jesse, Are these all the children? And he said, There remains yet the youngest. In the Hebrew language, this can also mean smallest. So we went from Eli, the strong muscle man, to David, the small one who stinks like sheep. He says, There remains the youngest, the one who's small. And behold, he is tending the sheep. Samuel said to Jesse, Send and bring him, for we will not sit down until he comes. Do you see this? He knew that this was the one that God had chosen and he knew that God's work was more important than anything else that they could do. We will not sit down. And he wasn't close by either. He wasn't. Do we make a priority what God makes a priority? Do we spend our time doing the things that God would have us to spend our time on? Or do we simply spend our time and our money and our energies satisfying ourselves and pleasing ourselves? Samuel's obedient to the very end. Even the last command that God gave him, arise and anoint him. He was obedient to do it. For this is he. Can you imagine what his brothers and Jesse and Samuel must have felt like when David was anointed and they had not even considered him? Did you know that David wasn't even cleansed and consecrated along with the other brothers back in the first verse? Did you know that? He was dirty stinky, sold clothes. And here were all these nice-smelling, oil-perfumed, consecrated people with their new clothes. 
And what did God say? Come on in, be a deacon, give us some money. Did He say that? <laughs> no, He says, I've rejected you. I've rejected you. Samuel took the horn of oil in the midst of his brothers, and the Spirit of the Lord came mightily upon David from that day forward. Unlike Saul, who had the Spirit of the Lord come on him in phases every now and then, King David had the Spirit of God on him continuously, even when he was a murderer and had Uriah the Hittite, Bathsheba's husband, killed, even when he did a census against the Lord's will. But here's the thing. <laughs> God tells us in His Word that I'm going to find a man after my own heart. And you know why David is said to be a man after God's own heart? Because he knew when he sinned that he needed to ask forgiveness and ask the Lord to forgive him because he knew he wasn't good. Do you get that? He knew that he wasn't good. So I'm going to put this challenge here as we close. The Gospel is simply this, guys. That God sent His Son into this world the best He could possibly give to pay a price that you and I could never pay. He came to this world to reconcile man who is, or excuse me, God who is holy, who is without spot or blemish, to man who is desperately wicked. The Bible tells us in John three nineteen through twenty one that we love darkness rather than light. Why is that? Because our deeds are evil. The Bible tells us in Jeremiah chapter 17, it says the heart is desperately wicked. Who can know it? Who can know it? But I tell you who can know it, and that is God. He knows your heart. Now you know how many people die every year of heart attacks in our country? A lot. Why? Because we like steaks. I like prime ribs and stuff. You can tell too probably. But here's the, here's the thing. Here's the thing. It's getting serious now. You know, God, God's in the spiritual surgery business, isn't He? If God could expose our hearts and, and, and put a list of every bad thing we've done in this room, I know every one of us would be ashamed. We're honest. Because the Bible says none are righteous. No, not even one. For all have fallen short of the glory of God. But the fact of the matter is, God wants us to be holy as He is holy. Leviticus 19.2 And the only way we can be holy is to accept this free gift of salvation through the perfect One. Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world, John would say. And this gift is free, but if I were to hold out a $20 bill, it wouldn't be a gift to one of these children or to any of you if you did not what? Accept it and receive it to yourself. Only you know where you stand today with God. My heart and prayer is that you will not leave today without knowing where you spend eternity if you were to die. Because the fact of the matter is, hell is real. Heaven is real. But if you reject this free gift of salvation, the Lord Jesus Christ, you will spend an eternity in hell and burn forever. And Jesus Christ died to keep you from going there. And I just want you to know I love you. This may be the last time I get to preach here. See how the future holds for us as we, you know, deal with search committees and stuff. But I, I had a heart, you know, to tell you the truth this morning. And this is serious stuff. You know, a lot of times as seminary students and stuff, we, 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 we talk about these things of God so often that it becomes... You know what we call uh, profane. It becomes common. But God, I tell you, God is holier than the holiest thing. And we should never speak of Him in a way that is unworthy. And we should never speak of Him as if He is common. And we should not think of the cross as merely an object of decoration. But it is the place where God sent His Son to die and to pay through the, the most crucial hardest thing you could ever imagine going through that. The Bible says in Isaiah 52 that he was more marred than any other human being on earth. 